Okay, we've just seen a wonderful promotional video on this wonderful institution um, where some of your colleagues are explaining how they're going to make a difference in the world and, and change everything and make it better. And I really think that's a good video because they're smiling and they believe they're going to do it and I think they should believe that and you should believe it too, all right? My problem is I want to know before I sign up for any immediate activism, what kind of a difference we're going to make. And since my concern in this course is research, I'm interested in what kind of a difference research can make. Uh, to save the world, yes, but let's say in most immediately in its relation to the translation, interpreting, localization professions. Okay? And in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give some examples of relations between research and the profession and industry and government and intergovernmental organizations that I think are, let's see, less than perfect. I'm being very polite, okay? Uh, let's see if it works. Here's a video. Uh, that we should propose some concrete action. This was recorded on the 25th of October in Brussels at the Directorate General for Translation. So that's sort of our profession, we're translators here. And this was a call from, I think, the president of the European Association of Legal Translator Associations. Okay, it's a, she's into legal translation, uh, she's a very important person, and she is asking for research to be done. All right, this is sort of a potential client for what we can do. Let's see what she says. Actually, and together with Haro, I looked at a concrete point of action. You can follow the uh, text that we have developed here on the screen. The rationale is that there is a need to convince the public and private sectors that the use of quality translators and translation services helps to achieve long-term savings. And I think to uh, help convince the, con uh, the decision makers of this, it is essential to provide hard data on these savings. And therefore we propose that one or two or several studies are conducted on the following subjects. The first one would be a proposal for a study on the cost effectiveness of translator training in relation to the expenditure for translation services. So this is a question of comparing how much does it cost the government to train a translator at a university and how much income, how much revenues does the government lose because they are not using, and uh, companies also, uh, do not use the quality services of well-trained translators. Losing, me, uh, losing income, here I mean, um, Translators not paying taxes, translators not paying social security contributions because their services are not being used so they cannot pay, uh, make any such payments. So um, the proposal is that a study should compare what is the cost to governments for training translators to the loss of revenues not paid by these qualified uh, translators in terms of social security contributions or taxes when their services are not used and uh, instead of their services the unqualified quote unquote translators are used uh, for translation services. So this would not be a study on um, what do we lose in terms of quality uh, and by not having fair trials, by not having fair uh, good standards at uh, legal proceedings, uh, but it's simply telling governments um, you are investing so much into the training of translators, why don't you try to get some money back in terms of revenues, in terms of taxes and social security contributions from these interpreters that you train at a certain expense. That is the one proposal and the other proposal is that for a study on the time effectiveness on using uh, qualified translators and also interpreters in relation to using unqualified ones. We can see, especially in the field of legal interpretation and translation, so interpreting for the courts, that uh, when you use unqualified interpreters, 
proceedings will take so much longer than when you use qualified ones. And the same goes for translation work. An experienced, a qualified translator can produce a, a translation at a different speed and at a different uh, pace than an unqualified one. So when uh, governments outsource uh, translation or interpreting services to unqualified uh, providers of these services, they think that they have short-term savings and they may also have, they may indeed have short-term savings, but in the long run, uh, because of miscarriages of justice, mistakes in translations and interpreting, the uh, long-term effects uh, will be very negative. So the second proposal is then uh, that uh, the qualified translators and interpreters can produce translation and interpreting output more effectively and efficiently. And this leads up to uh, long-term cost savings for the users of these services compared to the short-term cost savings that they may obtain uh, when resorting to unqualified translation and interpreting services. So this is not so much a, a quality study, but it's more of a macroeconomic study, uh, which I think uh, could be launched. And there is this EMT network here, universities training interpreters and translators. I'm sure that in their universities, there will be also departments uh, for economics, sociology or business administration or financial accounting and maybe they can talk to their colleagues in these departments and we can recruit some experts who will help us collect the uh, statistical data, the hard facts, the hard data that we would need uh, for such a study that we could then propose and show to governments. That's the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. So success guaranteed, I would say, just for the good order. Um. Success guaranteed. Why am I not really happy about that? That's somebody who wants research. She knows what she wants it for. She's got two research projects in mind. Her, the, the boss is found in charge of something in the training section of DGT. He's very happy, success guaranteed. Why am I not happy? Any guesses? No. It's good. Will you do that research? Okay. Can you draw up a research project for that? Yes, tell me, please. I don't know. It sounds like you kind of already had her mind made up about the results. I think she knows the results she wants to get. She just wants some numbers to prove it. Right. Yeah? Is that a good way to do research? Could be. How will you get those numbers? Okay, the first research project uh, says um, governments invest in training people like you and they'll get back their benefits when you pay taxes, basically, and social security, right? Is that a good model? Do you believe, would you, if you were a government, would you buy that argument? Why not? Okay. Yeah. So if I'm a freelancer and I'm supposed to pay more taxes to pay back the government, I don't know, it just... It... Okay, there are a couple of things wrong. Yes, help me out here, please. Uh, because you don't uh, need to be a translator to pay tax. Thank you. Any source of income you declare and you pay tax on it. Also, when you declare, Nobody asks you to have certification to see if you're a translator or not because we saw in a previous study that we carried out that only in one country in the world are translators required to have certification. Okay? So, for one thing, you're not going to get the data. Second, people pay taxes and Social Security anyway. And there's a third thing here. All right. Do you know what tiddlywinks is? I've got a video, but it's this game where you've got little little counters and you get them into a, into a jar. All right, in the PowerPoint there's a link you can check on. It's a game, all right? Played in pubs in Britain originally, a hundred years ago, and now there's an international championship in Tiddlywinks I've discovered. You can say, I want my society to invest in Tiddlywinks, 
train people in university at, in tiddlywinks, and you'll save money because the professional tiddlywink players will pay taxes later on. Will your government buy this? Don't think so. So the first project, the first research design that she wants, I mean, she'll get some numbers, she can manipulate them and present them, but I don't think it's going to convince, I hope it won't convince, the governments that I pay taxes to. What about this second project? Um, she said uh, that the courts lose money because they don't employ professional translators and interpreters, certified, qualified, she said, qualified. How would you do that? How would you quantify how much money you lose on not having qualified translators and interpreters? Um, very difficult. I mean, you'd have to find miscarriages of justice, that is, retrials, due to interpretation or translation mistakes. And there are some cases, but very few. And you would have to really extrapolate quite precariously to get anywhere. And in any case, Okay, when we did a study on this, on the status of translators, we found that there are, are, are lots of unqualified interpreters, especially, being used in the justice systems. Why are they being used? Because they're cheaper? Sometimes, but not necessarily. Basically because they need professionals for many non-European languages, and not the big Asian languages either because they need them for immigrants, and immigrants speak many, many different languages, and there are not qualified professionals for those languages. So you could use the reverse argument. You could say, if you only use qualified translators and interpreters, you cannot provide justice to all these people. And you will have to keep them waiting for one or two years. In asylum, probably, as illegal immigrants, that's going to cost your governments a lot of money and bring about human rights issues for them. It might save money in those cases to use unqualified interpreters and translators, which is what most governments do. So I'm worried that somebody comes and tells us researchers the results we have to get and particularly for research designs and ideologies that I think are inherently flawed. All right, I'm getting into trouble because this is recorded, but I think I know <laughs> it's okay. okay. Uh, other research done for the same institution, for the Directorate General for Translation, for example, uh, shows and argues that the, the language industry, that's translation, interpreting, the whole lot, is huge. And this is regarded as, as being a good thing because it creates value. You know, the more translators and interpreters your society has, the more value is created. Does that convince you? That is, the more you guys have work, the better your society is. The argument's like this. The larger the tiddlywink industry, the richer and happier the society. Oh, no. Well, yeah, if everybody plays tiddlywinks, that's fine. If everybody needs tiddlywinks, that's good too. But if they don't? I mean, there are fundamental flaws here. Um, the fact that you have a large service industry, financed largely from governments, in this case in Europe, doesn't mean it makes your society happier or richer, because it's essentially non-productive. It's a service, okay? And, and the, the, the missing link here is that translation and interpreting only really make your societies richer when it's in the service of export, of trade, which it is sometimes, but not in the majority of the cases that money is being spent on. Okay. Uh, trade and related exchanges of, of, of knowledge, I guess. Um, so, so the general argument that uh, we study this, we find that it's very big, it doesn't necessarily translate or move or, or, or imply that it's providing value or wealth or making people much richer. Uh, the arguments in favor of translation and interpreting 
uh, often then shift to the field of human rights. Okay, we can't show that um, it's better for a society had to have a lot of you people, translators and interpreters, instead of everybody learning English. In fact, if, you, if you're worried about efficiencies, that's what's happening. The lingua franca grows, uh, and people find that a more efficient solution. Uh, the argument then becomes, no, translation and interpretation is a question of human rights. People have uh, a right to access to knowledge and information, a fundamental human right. That sounds better. That sounds like something Miss would want to work for, I think. Okay? Change it, make it better, make a difference. I'd like you, though, to look now at a piece of research. Can you go into iLearn? You've got your laptops here. And just click on that link, or it will go into iLearn uh, over here and find the link. I want you to answer a questionnaire. Hmm, where are we? Action research down here. Survey for a good cause. Click on that one. And, and you've got the link there, actually. You'll have to cut and paste. I'm sorry about that. And you'll get into something uh, looking like this. Okay? This is from 2010. It's a a couple of years ago, there was a G20 conference coming up. Okay, G20, what does that mean? Yeah, the, the 20 big uh, industrial countries get together to decide the fate of the world. And uh, they were preparing a, a workshop there on translation, the translation industry. And they have a project for stimulating uh, the numbers of translations and actually localization uh, done in the world. So you are asked to um, fill in these um, questions. Have you got it there? No? Just go ahead and do it. I think it works, won't it? Improved education. Nah, not important. Improved health. No way. Justice. Don't believe it. Go to next. Yes, it does. The question is, how important do you consider the role of language and translation to be in relation to the following? Improved education, improved health, improved justice, improved environmental conditions, improved economic well-being. What would you put as language professionals? What is it in your interest to put? Improved education. What? Yeah, but you can say... For improving education so is a asking good... asking in relation to it, not what we think... Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Question. I'll read the question again. <laughs> How important do you consider the role of language and translate... Language and translation language and translation together to be in relation to the following all good things I mean you'd be an idiot wouldn't you if you didn't click first priority starting now wouldn't you if you're a language professional and that's who the questionnaire was addressed to also I could be interested in uh, saving money by having everybody learn English in their education for the health services, for the justice systems, etc. And that would be cheaper than having translation and interpretation. And I know that, but in this survey, can I put that in? No, because it asks me about language and translation together. Hey, you can't have, a, you can't have education without language. That's got to be. So why did they do this survey, do you think? To justify whatever they wanted. To justify exactly what they decided they were going to say. They're going to have a workshop, and at the beginning they're going to say, empirical research shows that 
99.9% .9 of the 120 people who responded believe that. Okay. And of course, the people who responded are the people in the language industries. And the people who are not would have no way of knowing what they're asking about anyway. The, the, the question is so vague, uh, and, and the actual question, the, the design of the research is intentionally oriented towards getting just one result. And you see why I'm not happy. I mean, I'm, I'm for the industry. And I'm not against education, health, justice, and etc. But hey, I'm worried about the role of research in that kind of situation. This is another example. This is a, a piece of research done for the same institution, the DGT. The last one there wasn't. It was organized by people in Ireland, okay, who are act localization activists, and they do some very good work uh, apart from that question. Okay, this was a survey also based on questionnaires, uh, and it was figuring out, uh, figuring out the major effects of translation, the social effects of translation. Why do we need translation? What is it good for? And here are their findings. Immigrants, visibilities to small countries, allow citizens to understand the laws, ensures worker safety, Dissemination of cultural goods, uh, informs about products produced in foreign countries, safety of consumers, NGOs provide support in crises. Hey, they're all really good things, aren't they? So translation and interpretation are really good things necessary for all of this. Why am I not happy? Why am I not happy? I mean, the question was, what are the effects of translation? What do you think the social effects of translation are or could be? Greater dissemination of information. Yeah, but are there any negative effects? If it's not translated well. Sure. Do you find any bad translations anywhere in normal social life? All over the place. Okay, so we could easily put a list here uh, like uh, misunderstanding, misinformation, higher communication costs, fewer meetings between different cultures, um, interference in the normal language patterns of smaller languages, because translation is one of the main uh, spheres of interference. Couldn't we get a list of negative effects easily? And surely I could put out a questionnaire and get people, probably not translators or translator trainers, to agree to those negative things. And so this report, which was financed and paid for and keeps everybody happy, could be balanced by another report that would make everyone worry. It could be done. But it's not going to be done because nobody's going to pay me to do that second piece of research. Here's another one. I went in just a minute ago to the website of the Directorate General for Translation. I'm, I'm never going to work for these guys again. <laughs> but I don't want me to. Not but it's there. What does it cost? It costs 330 million euros a year. All right? And that means that for every person in the European Union, I'm sorry if you don't care about Europe, but I happen to live there. <laughs> the translation services and interpretation services are cheap. 60 cents. 60 cents will buy you, where I live, about half a cup of coffee. Okay, coffee's still cheap in Spain. All right. uh, and they say, this is wonderful. Each citizen in the European Union has the right to write to the European institutions in their language, at, in, the, in the citizen's language, and receive a reply in the citizen's language, if their language is a national language. But anyway, that, that's a, another point. This is wonderful. This is a multilingual democracy at work with access to knowledge. All the laws, all the European regulations are in all the national languages. 
for, for a cup of coffee. Are you convinced? You're convinced. Now, on the same webpage, I read this morning, in 2012, they produced 1.76 million pages. These guys are working a lot. That's a lot of pages. You can imagine them stacked up and all that translating and it's translation and editing that they do, uh, copy editing. That's, that's a hell. Gee, these guys are working well. What is bothering me? Yes, please. Thinking about how much it costs per page. Good. Can you work out in your head, more or less, how much it costs per page? Well, that was a good guess, but I figured 187 euros per page, which is, the dollar's pretty weak today, 252 US dollars per page, per page of output. Hey, these are my taxes. Who's getting that paid per page? What are these guys doing? Okay, how much do you get paid per page if you've done any placements, any internships? Any idea? You know, you, the maximum you could think, oh, I don't know, 80, 80 dollars, something like that? If you really, really, you know, yeah. that's a good page, 80 dollars. So. <laughs> 252! <laughs> all right, what's happening here is that in all the talks that they give, all the promotional talks, you get this information, the cup of coffee, and everything sounds great, nothing to worry about. But if you can do a little occasional math, on publicly available information, you've got something to worry about. It's incredibly expensive and could be made surely much, much cheaper and much more efficient. But nobody wants research done on that, and you can imagine why. I wonder that guy who said success guaranteed, I wonder what his salary is. <laughs> you know, that's included there. Other things. Um, so two years ago, we did a research project for these very same people on the status of translators. I showed it to you, read part of it, I believe. Yeah? And, um, you know, you get, a, you, you get the job and you wonder, well, why am I doing this? And, and it seemed at the time quite logical that a study of how translators are in these various societies, what relative status they have, would be a good preliminary step uh, towards improving the status. And improving the status, you, you find at the end of that report, the recommendation is that there should be a certification system, a unified certification system. Right, so I thought, this is great. I can make a difference. All this work we did will help set up the certification system, which will help improve the status of translators and therefore our societies. And I really believe that. However, as the research progressed, it became very aware that the clients had already decided what kind of certification system they were going to set up. The research was commissioned, brought in, to justify a decision that had already been made. And no matter, it didn't matter what we put in the, in the report. It didn't matter at all. It was going to, by definition, justify the decision that was set up there. And that's indeed the way it's played out, and that's the way it often happens. Why do people commission research? Because they want to find something out that they don't know? No, because they want to justify what they think they already know. At least in my limited experience. I'm, going, I'm giving you examples of what I would call the instrumentalization of research. The way the get the production of knowledge is ah, manipulated to strong word, but is applied to ends that are other than the production of knowledge. All right, and that happens. I'll give you one final example, or should I? You know, you looked at all those interviews of translation scholars. Okay, there were fifty or so of them. Uh, you might be aware that among that group, that little community of fifty people. One person boycotted two of the other uh, through a policy which you can see there uh, that scholars employed by Israeli universities uh, are at the moment, as I speak, still 
uh, not allowed to uh, publish in some translation study journals, and two of them um, uh, were ousted, were thrown out of the, of the committees of two journals. So you can see that instrumentalization affects us in a different way, not in the kind of knowledge we produce, but the networks we have for producing knowledge within that very small community. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I just find it interesting that you were looking at these people and it looks like it's a happy little world. And it is a happy little world among these academics. Uh, passionate about translation and, and interpretation and language in general. Uh, but then things like this come in. And I remember this uh, happening 2002, 11 years ago now. And it started off in a rather innocuous way when uh, people complained that European research projects were open to academics in Israel but not in the neighboring Arabic countries. And a petition went around to remove Israel from that list. And at the time, my idea was, no, you shouldn't remove Israel. You should include the Arabic countries. I mean, it's absolutely unfair that one country in the Middle East participates and the others don't. That's, that's incredibly unjust. You should have an inclusive thing, and everybody, everybody in that region um, should be participating. It never went that way, though. It went towards, and then Israel didn't help itself by, you know, behaving, uh, you know, destroying every human right that's ever been written up uh, in the intervening period. Uh, and the fact remains that we have been there for some 11 years, and it doesn't look like that's changing. Uh, so it doesn't matter what kind of research, you know, what matters is not the quality of the knowledge we produced, produced, but how it's instrumentalized, not only by our clients, but by the networks that produce it. So what worries me here is that research, such as I find it, is being used. Well, about one, to protect a threatened profession, and I'm going to develop that idea in a minute. Two, to justify decisions that have already been made, but that happens all over the place in every social science. Three, to justify noble causes, like the G20 thing, that justify it without questioning the nature of those causes or the way of helping them uh, more efficiently or even more um, legitimately in terms of rights. And, and finally, it legitimizes a certain restricted community of researchers, uniting them to certain causes which are extraneous to the matter of research itself. And even then, I haven't gone into the next question of who provides the money for the research. This is even before you get into those sort of... Um, the idea that since you're getting money from someone, you're going to say what they want you to say. It doesn't always happen. I want to say why it doesn't always happen. You can't see it, but sometimes, about once every three years, I have to wear an academic gown and a funny little hat. And my university has the worst funny little hats you could possibly imagine. It's like a, a curtain, curtain rain, curtain edges around the hat, you know, it's a big, you know. And it's all in light blue velvety stuff. It's, uh, it reminds me once every three years that the profession I work in, that of the academic institutions of the world, um, has its origins in actually in Islamic institutions which were brought into Europe between the 10th and, and the 12th centuries and, uh, and developed, you know, it's a medieval institution, the one I work in, when I have that gown, okay. Uh, and a lot of my ideas about what I do as an academic and as a researcher are based on that funny hat and gown that I have to wear. Um, as I might have mentioned, I spent some time researching the 12th century in Spain, and I was fascinated by the role of intellectuals in that period, and that's really where my ideas came from. It's not from you know relations with Israel now or any of these debates. It comes from a, a long way back. Um, and I sort of believe that when I do this work as an academic or researcher, I'm there to produce knowledge, 
and knowledge is its own reward. That's good enough for me. Uh, I'm passionate about that, and I share that passion with about 50 or so people around the world, as you've seen. And that's good, and I don't care how much they get paid, how much I get paid. A bit of plagiarism, I don't really care either. Um, I don't care who uses that knowledge for whatever they want to do with it. All right? For me, the thing that I want to do is find it. Like those crazy scholars in the north of what is now Spain were convinced they could find a way to navigate using the stars and uh, turn uh, every metal into gold. Anyway, they thought they were looking for knowledge. By the same token, everything I produce can be produced with anyone. There's, you know, in this particular ideology of the profession, everybody can participate and everybody can get it for free. I'm really happy putting everything I've published on my website and I'm not too bad about downloading lots of illegal books from other websites or downloading, downloading the books illegally, as, as some of you might do with amazing frequency. <laughs> So that's why I'm really upset at all those cases of instrumentalization. There is a point at which the funny hat and the are going to say, no, I won't be used that way. Somebody else can do it for you, but not me. I'm not going to do it that way. There's a sort, certain ethics written into the, to the professional identity. And that ethics runs into conflict, where, for, for example, in this very institution, we have the meeting of academics and, and, and vocational profession, professionals. People who come from the translation and interpreting profession are here meeting people who come from the academic side. Most of us have got a bit of both. But there is a voice within me that says, wait a minute. You know, my first allegiance is to this stuff up here. It doesn't apply. It does not imply any neutrality. When I go out and do a research project, I want to find certain stuff. I don't want to find... You all saw it in the interviews. I asked you, was the interviewer biased? Everybody said, yes. <laughs> Very good. You're biased because you want certain information and you don't want other information. And you're involved in it. Of course, I'm a member of the community. I'm doing the interviews from within the community. There is no neutral position involved. So the problem is, how can you do research in which you're involved and yet not have it instrumentalized, used for other ends? That's the problem that I face once a year, in recent years. And I'm going to give you two quick answers to it, and then we turn the video off before I get into even more trouble. Uh, the first. Both ideas are, are from the philosopher Karl Popper, Austrian philosopher of science. Okay? And the first idea he had was that when you do research, well, we have many ideas, but the first that interests me here is that you have your hypothesis. You know I've insisted a lot on the hypothesis in your research designs, and it should be falsifiable. It should be possible for it to be wrong. You can't have a hypothesis that says uh, translation is, ah, oh, what do we do? There's no, there's basically there's no hypothesis in the stuff I'm being presenting, you know? Uh, when, when that woman there says, we need research that shows that, that's not a falsifiable hypothesis. She knows what she's going to find and she's going to keep digging until she finds it. She does not want to set up a research project that could prove her wrong. And she'll select, you know, she'll change the terms, manipulate the variables, get the sample she wants until it's shown that she's right. You need to be able to falsify it. You need to have a statement there that stands a chance of being wrong. And it follows, and this is Popper's most wonderful thing, that we never discover truth. Uh, as science, any science, social science, exact science, physics, anything, goes along, we formulate these hypotheses and test them. And we can only test, the only result we get is that the hypothesis is wrong. If it's falsifiable, some of them are going to be wrong. 
And what do we know? Now, some of knowledge as we move along in the world, we know that that hypothesis is wrong, that one's wrong, that one's wrong, that one. Do we know which hypothesis is true? No. We only know that something has not yet been falsified. You're not going to get to a final truth. It's not going to happen. We're not going to be, be able to say, you know, translation makes societies happier. I would love to be able to say that. The more translators in the society, the happier the society. That would be a wonderful thing to discover. But we can't. We don't have that information. We only know that there are many societies with numerous languages and therefore lots of translators that are not excessively happy. Or linguistic diversity. Where are the places in the world with the most languages per square kilometer? If you look on the map, well, the highlands of New Guinea and the uh, eastern area of Congo. Uh, some of the poorest, the most chaotic and warlike places in the world. That's what language diversity could be associated with if you look at it objectively and try to do comparisons. Okay, uh, so I, I'm interested in these ideas that um, research can be done and you can work with all these other people and the clients and you provide the knowledge that they want. Uh, if we insist that in our profession, my profession, uh, the research project is set up so it could be falsified. It could be wrong. That's all I could ask for. It's only the first guarantee, though. I want to turn the video off now, and then we go on to other stuff. Thank you.